the question is, all these things we see, how do you decide what's real and what's not real? Okay, because believe me, I'm going to say right now, 99% of it is not real, um, especially when it comes to anti-aging, but I'm not talking about just anti-aging right now. So, <clears throat> are diet sodas good or bad? Okay. Well, I'm not even going to try to answer the question because I am not qualified to answer this question. Okay, but I want to use it as an example. But the question is, are good because because not you hear this all the time, but is it true? Is aspartame bad for you or not? I mean, is a special interest groups trying to get you to believe that it's bad because Diet Coke is the number one selling soft drink there is, and everybody wants to bring them down so that people go buy their products? I mean, is it true or not? Well, let me get back to you for in a second here. Ibuprofen. Is, this is another one you hear a lot. A lot of people in the press news are saying, don't take ibuprofen. It's really bad for you. Okay, again, I'm not going to be answering these questions tonight. I'm just going to be giving a protocol on how to answer them yourself. And part of, I don't want to get into debates, um, especially about something I don't know very much about. But, um, <clears throat> GMOs. We all hear GMOs are really bad for you. But are they really? You know, or is it just some special interest group trying to get you to think so? Eggs. You, we've all heard eggs are bad for you. Okay? And then, and then, and then later, well, so what happened? In the 1980s, everybody believed eggs were bad for you. They believed they're filled with cholesterol, and when you eat eggs, all that cholesterol goes into your blood. So in the 1980s, this is what we were all led to believe. You know, if it's really true, then why don't we still believe that? Okay, so if people were saying this in the 1980s that eggs were bad, where did they get their data from? Did anybody go to look at it? Or did people just take everybody's word for it? When, the, when people got on the news and the TV commercials and stuff like that saying, eggs are bad, we just believed it, all right? So why, in 2015, do we now say eggs are good for you? Okay, well, <laughs> what happened? Well, okay, so <clears throat> the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, let me get out of everybody's way, in 2015 says there's no appreciable relationship between consumption of dietary cholesterol and serum blood cholesterol. What that's saying is that if you eat cholesterol, it doesn't end up in your blood. Okay, well, why did people think it used to? And why did they say it on the news and stuff like that and make us all believe it? Okay, now they come out and say, well, what do you know? They fed radioactively labeled cholesterol into a person and it never showed up in the blood. We now know that the cholesterol comes from fats that get produced by your liver. Okay, so we now have all these rules about fats. Maybe those aren't true either, but right now we believe they are. But I believe it's, it's really not that we just can't take the word of all these people in the news telling us. And, and, and eggs, I think, is a good example. Okay, so <clears throat> where do we get our data from? Well, one of the most common places is anecdotal data. Okay, so testimonies, testimonials. Um, we all get these all the time. Our friends tell us we believe it. Uh, we hear it in the news, we believe it. Um, but, you know, it's not all true. Okay, I mean, with the exception of maybe isogenics. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of isogenics because I do believe in all their products and stuff, and I, and I know they're scientists. Okay, so then the next thing is case studies. And this is a big problem, I think, especially in the medical community. A doctor will look at one patient, case studies usually mean one patient, they'll look at one patient that has some kind of heart disease or some kind of cancer, and they do something special, and they cure it. And they write a paper on it, and they get up and talk in front of an audience. And everybody believes this is what we must do. I mean, I'm thinking of examples like some woman saying that she cured her husband of Alzheimer's with coconut oil. The coconut oil prices, I mean, the, the market of them just skyrocketed, and so did the prices because of that. And nobody knows that her husband died shortly thereafter from Alzheimer's. Yeah. But it's, it's like that all got lost somewhere in the, in the background. But it's, it's case studies just don't mean anything. 
And then there's scientifically peer-reviewed articles, studies. So this, I always talk about scientifically peer-reviewed journal articles. This is one of the best places to get something or to find out if something in the future is going to work. Because this is typically usually still at the research phase when you, when you read these journal articles. And then there's double-blind placebo-controlled studies. And this is where something has actually gotten into the do hands of the doctors and they're now doing a study with a whole bunch of people. Double-blind placebo is probably the best way to do a clinical study and get something meaningful. Now, I did forget to put one thing on here. Um, number five is ask Bill Falloon. <laughs> okay. Now, I forgot all about that one until I heard Jim talk about Bill Falloon. But uh, it's, uh, and, and I, I'll tell you, I've known Bill Falloon for, I'd say, 10 years now, and he's so adamant about doing whatever he can for his own health that he, he never lets anything get by, and he is so critical of the FDA and gov other government organizations and stuff, and you can read about it in, in their uh, magazine. Okay, so <clears throat> these are the things you can do, but I would draw the line right there, okay? I mean, I really wouldn't spend a lot of time looking, believing anecdotal data. That leads us into a lot of wrong uh, decisions. I wouldn't be doing case studies either. That also leads us into wrong directions. Okay, so PubMed is probably the best place to go to look at scientifically peer-reviewed journal articles. I've shown this slide before. I just want to show it again. That's the website, but you don't need to write it down because all you got to do is Google PubMed. It stands for Publications in Medicine. And <clears throat> it's published in scientifically, these are articles that are published in scientifically peer-reviewed journals, meaning that not only did the scientists do the study, but then when they submitted it to the journal, the journal sent it to a whole bunch of other scientists and had them read the study and see if this is legit, and they had to approve it. So it was peer-reviewed peer and peer-approved. Okay, next level is to actually go to look at the clinical studies. And you can do that at www.clinicaltrials.gov. People don't know this, but it's, it's, it's starting to get out now. If you, if you really want to find a really good doctor, if you, if you have cancer or heart disease or something like that, and you want to find a really good doctor, find a doctor that's actually participating in clinical studies. And, and you will find that there's a lot of things going on that, that most doctors don't even know. I call most doctors cattle herders because they got so many patients. They're just getting in and out, in and out. You know, a patient comes in, next one goes out, et cetera. Uh, and they don't have time to really treat the individual. But clinical, clinical trial doctors do. So I recommend seeing those type of doctors. <clears throat> now, they're not always right. Okay, so PubMed and clinical studies aren't always right. This is a little scientific. Uh, I mean, usually when I'm speaking to scientific audiences, they're already laughing because they, they can read this stuff and, and know what it's saying. But let me just try to, this is two, <laughs> this is two articles, scientifically peer-reviewed journal articles that came out in the same journal, the Journal of Immunology, two weeks apart from each other. And they both say, they're both talking about immortalization with telomerase. Okay, but two weeks apart from each other in the same journal, probably by the same peer-reviewed scientist, one says that telomerase immortalizes the cells, the other one says it's not sufficient to immortalize the cells. And so, so you can't believe everything, even in PubMed. So what I recommend is you don't just rely on one study. Just, and this is one of the reasons I'm opposed to case studies. You find all the studies. So you do a search in clinicaltrials.gov or PubMed, you find all the studies. You find that you'll find that 99 will support 99 percent of them will support one claim, and one percent will support the other claim. Well, go with the 99 percent. <laughs> okay, and that's what happens. A lot of people, a lot of a lot of people who are trying to market some product, they'll take that one percent, and they'll show it in their website or their press releases and stuff like that, and get you to believe that their product is doing something. And the big problem that I, I should have said earlier when I was talking about anecdotal data and case studies, if you want to find anything, if you want to find that uh, just standing up is bad for you or sitting down is bad for you, you know, anything like that, you can find it, okay? You can go to Google, do a Google search, you're going to find some study that's going to say one thing or another, especially when you're dealing with anecdotal data and you're dealing with uh, case studies. 
Okay, well, you're going to also find it here. You're going to find studies that somehow got approved, and I don't know how, but sometimes they do. And so it's good, like one thing I'm really good at, I'm really good at reading the studies and being able to figure out which ones are full of crap and which ones aren't, okay? And especially in my own field of telomere biology. But, and, and there's a lot of it. I mean, especially in the field of anti-aging, there's, as I, I say this all the time, there's more quacks and charlatans than any other field I've ever seen. And so weeding these people out is really a big, uh, something I have to do all the time. Okay, <clears throat> so, is diet sodas, ibuprofen, GMOs, eggs good or bad for you? Again, I'm not gonna answer, I'm gonna let, show you how to answer yourself. What do the scientifically peer-reviewed studies say? I think if people went to this, they'd be really surprised, okay? What does the double-blind placebo-controlled studies say? Again, I think you'd be really surprised. And you'd, your whole attitude would be changing about things. Next time somebody sees me drinking a Diet Coke, don't say, hey, are you crazy? You know, just maybe, maybe I am. Maybe I, maybe I just like it so much I'll, do, I'll take the risk. But it's, it might, I don't know. Who, I don't want to answer the question today, though. Okay, but don't rely on anecdotal data or case studies. Okay, it's just, they just, you can find anything that says anything, especially with anecdotal data and case studies. <clears throat>